on the website. Now, if you have ever wondered when or whether detectives ever give up on these sorts of investigations, then our next case says a great deal. It goes all the way back to 1975 to the murder of a young woman in Preston in Lancashire. The inquiry at the time was huge. It involved nearly 200 detectives who interviewed around 30,000 people. One of them was, uh, in fact, the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. But it would be another 33 years before the police would know for sure who really killed Joan Harrison. On a cold November morning in 1975, the body of a woman was found in a derelict garage in the Avonham area of Preston. Her brutal murder would become one of Lancashire's most notorious and longest-running cases, lasting over three decades and leading detectives on a trail to one of Britain's most infamous serial killers. But now there is no doubt that the Ripper has claimed his latest victim. What have we got? Murder boss. But now detectives can finally close the file on this gruelling 35-year murder mystery. What's other name? The old Mary Harrison. Joan was um, a 26-year-old uh, young mother when she met her death. Um, she lived in and around Preston for most of, of her life. I think her family would forgive me for saying that she'd fallen on hard times. She was addicted to alcohol. Uh, we know she was addicted to cough mixtures. Uh, and I think life in 1970s Preston would have been pretty tough for Joan. On the night of her murder, Joan was last seen near the centre of Preston, looking for a late-night drink. It was the last time she was seen alive. Two days later, Joan was discovered by a passerby. She was laying face down, partially clothed, with her coat and boots richly placed over her body. The man tasked with leading the investigation was Detective Superintendent Wilf Brooks. Well, we know that uh, when Mr. Brooks went into that garage, he would have been first with a, a shocking murder scene. It was clear that Joan had suffered extensive head injuries. Um, it's more than likely she'd suffered a uh, sexual assault, and she had suffered a uh, significant bite mark to her body. The barbaric details of her murder shocked the community. Whoever murdered Joan was an extremely violent and dangerous man. The investigation that followed would become one of the biggest in Lancashire's history. The only forensics available at the time was blood grouping, and samples at the scene revealed the killer could have an extremely rare blood type. So police concentrated their efforts on men with a history of violence, who also matched that specific blood group. But by July 1976, the exhaustive investigation was no nearer catching Jones' killer. With no new major leads, the investigation was wound down. Jones' killer had slipped through the net. But three years later, Jones' murder would suddenly be thrust back into the spotlight. I'm asking you what you think about this latest ripper attack. It just goes sick, really. I will never go out on my own tonight. As the Yorkshire Ripper spread terror across the north of England, West Yorkshire police received letters and a tape claiming to be from the killer, taunting the police and naming Joan Harrison's 1975 murder in Preston as one of his. Not only did he claim responsibility for killing her, but saliva on the letter's envelope revealed that he had the same rare blood type that had been left at the Joan Harrison murder scene. It was enough to convince Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield, the man leading the Ripper inquiry. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, you are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. In the summer of 1979, with Detective Wilf Brooks of Lancashire Police by his side, George Oldfield announced for the first time that he thought this was the Yorkshire Ripper and Joan Harrison was another one of his victims. But what the public didn't know was the man sitting next to George Oldfield 
had serious reservations that the murders were linked. I understand from Mr Brooks that he, he had actually met uh, prior to the press conference with George Oldfield and expressed some doubt that the uh, John Harrison case was actually connected to the Yorkshire Ripper case. Buckner, covered by a blanket, was then rushed, but in January 1981, with Peter Sutcliffe in custody and the letters and tape finally discredited as a hoax, Detective Brooks got the chance to ask the Ripper face to face. I'm Detective Chief Superintendent Will Brooks from Lancashire Police. I couldn't have the John Harrison murder. You've already confessed to the others. Did you kill John Harrison? No. No, I didn't do it. Sutcliffe had been ruled out of the Joan Harrison investigation and detectives were back to square one. It would be a further 29 years before the true identity of Joan's killer would finally be revealed. Murder inquiries are, are never closed and in this particular case uh, the constabulary has been determined to bring it to a, a conclusion. Um, Lancashire has worked very closely with the Forensic Science Service to unravel what has always been a very complex forensic picture. From 1997, new DNA techniques were able to conclusively rule out key suspects in the murder, including Peter Sutcliffe and John Humble, the hoaxer found to have sent the Ripper letters and tape. Then, in 2010, after identifying a number of different DNA profiles, the team finally had a breakthrough. The key was to be able to look at the photographic records of the scene and the forensic notes. It quickly became obvious looking at the evidence holistically, that one particular DNA profile stood out as being potentially that of the killer. And when they loaded that profile onto the DNA database, they got a hit. Two years earlier, a man had been arrested for a drink driving offence in Leeds, and his DNA placed on the database. That man was 60-year-old Christopher Smith. When detectives looked into Smith's background, they discovered that Joan Harrison's murder was only the beginning. We could see a man whose offending behaviour had uh, increased considerably uh, in the years from 1981 onwards, become increasingly violent, particularly towards women. In 1981, Smith subjected a teenager to a vicious attack which bore shocking similarities to Joan's death. Two years later, Smith stabbed and killed his first wife and their unborn child in a furious dispute. Well, by 1985, Smith was married for the second time, uh, and again, an incredibly volatile uh, relationship. Uh, and during the course of that marriage, we do know that uh, he pushed her through a window when she was seven months pregnant. Uh, we now have a man who was very violent, um, described by his own family as... Uh, as uh, being violent, a boastful, uh, aggressive man. But how did Joan Harrison become one of his victims? We still don't know for absolute certain, but what is certain is that during, uh, during 1975, Smith served a period of imprisonment uh, within HMP Preston, uh, and it's more than likely he was actually released to a hostel uh, nearby. And we do know now that, uh, that Joan used to frequent that hostel. Remarkably, whilst again serving time, Smith had actually been interviewed as part of the original investigation. Smith had been interviewed uh, in the months following uh, John's death because uh, he had stolen uh, a lady's handbag. Um, but at that time, it wasn't apparent that he was a violent man. He just presented as a petty thief. And as a consequence, he was discounted from the inquiry. With the pieces of the jigsaw falling into place, all detectives needed now was Smith himself. But just six days after his arrest for drink driving, he was dead. Smith died in uh, 2008 after uh, a long battle against cancer. 
Now, of course, as a senior investigator, it uh, is some considerable personal regret that uh, he didn't have a chance to stand uh, trial for, for this terrible crime. However, when detectives recovered some of Smith's belongings, among them, hidden away in a drawer, was a scrawled three-page note. I would like to put the record straight. I can't go on with the guilt. I have lived with it for over 20 years. We found a note, which to my mind is clearly a confession note. And it's significant for me that he, he wrote that letter the day before he died. He talks about being remorseful, things that he's done. And he's clearly concerned about the law catching up with him. After all these years, racked with guilt and dying of cancer, Smith finally confessed, begging forgiveness for his terrible crime. There's no question that had Smith been alive today, he would have been charged with John Harrison's murder. And I've every confidence he would have been convicted of her murder. And I can only try to imagine the sense of sadness that John's family have carried over all these years. And I truly hope it brings some sense of, of closure for their tragic loss. What a lot of twists and turns. Mm. And finally, after three decades in Amsterdam. Finally, it was a massive investigation. Thousands interviewed and swabbed, but never a breakthrough. This case became so entwined with the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry because of the blind alley of the hoax. In one of the first letters to George Oldfield, it taunted him. It said, up to eight now, you say seven, remember Preston 75, a reference to okay. Joan's murder. And George Oldfield convinced himself that the tapes and the letters were genuine, and of course they were. Talking to detectives, what did you find out about Christopher Smith, the man? Well, he was born Alexander Smith in Londonderry in 1947, had a lot of aliases. Even as a boy, he frightened his own family with his explosions of violence. He was a petty criminal, he was an alcoholic, and he saw he killed his first wife, he almost killed his second wife, he kidnapped and threatened to kill his third wife. I mean, a frightening character. Truly. Um, what do you make of the deathbed confession? Well, it was quite self-serving. It was all about him, the guilt he carried, how much he loved his family, how he'd been out of trouble for the last 20 years. Actually, the police and his family say the violence never stopped right to the end. You know... Sometimes justice can be less than perfect. He escaped prison, but for Joan's family, at least they now know who killed her. And I suppose that's something. Thanks, Matthew. Now, we've just got time for a final update.